Mandelbrot graphed the noise data, and what he saw surprised him. Regardless of the time scale, the graph looked similar. One day, one hour, one second. It didn't matter. It looked about the same. It turned out to be so similar with a vengeance. Mandelbrot was amazed. The strange pattern reminded him of something that had intrigued him as a young man. A mathematical mystery that dated back nearly a hundred years. The mystery of the monsters. The story really begins in the late 19th century. Mathematicians had written down a formal description of what a curve must be, but within that description, there were these other things. Things that satisfied the formal definition of what a curve is, but were so weird that you could never draw them, or you couldn't even imagine drawing them. They were just regarded as monsters or, or things beyond the realm. They're not lines. They're nothing like lines. They're not circles. They were, like, really, really weird. The German mathematician Georg Cantor created the first of the monsters in 1883. He just took a straight line, and he said, I'm going to break this line into thirds, and the middle third I'm going to erase. So you're left with two lines at each end. And now I'm going to take those two lines, take out the middle third, and we'll do it again. So he does that over and over again. Most people would think, well, if I've thrown everything away, eventually there's nothing left. Not the case. There's not just one point left. There's not just two points left. There's infinitely many points left. As you zoom in on the Cantor set, the pattern stays the same, much like the noise patterns that Mandelbrot had seen at IBM. Another strange shape was put forward by the Swedish mathematician Helga von Koch. Koch said, was, well, you start with an equilateral triangle, one of the classical Euclidean geometric figures, and on each side, I take a piece and I substitute two pieces that are now longer than the original piece. And for each of those pieces, I substitute two pieces that are each longer than the original piece. Over and over again, you get the same shape, but now each line has that little triangular bump on it. And I break it again, and I break it again, and I break it again. And each time I break it, the line gets longer. Every iteration, every cycle, he's adding on another little triangle. Imagine iterating that process of adding little bits infinitely many times. What you end up with is something that's infinitely long. The Koch curve was a paradox. To the eye, the curve appears to be perfectly finite. But mathematically, it is infinite, which means it cannot be measured. At the time, they called it a pathological curve because it made no sense according to the way people were thinking about measurement in Euclidean geometry and so on. But the Koch curve turned out to be crucial to a nagging measurement problem, the length of a coastline. In the 1940s, British scientist Lewis Richardson had observed that there can be great variation between different measurements of a coastline. It depends on how long a yardstick is, how much patience you have. If you measure the coastline of Britain with a one-mile yardstick, you get so many yardsticks, which gives you so many miles. If you measure with a one-foot yardstick, it turns out that it's longer. And every time you use a shorter yardstick, you get a longer number, because you can always find finer indentations. Mandelbrot saw that the finer and finer indentations in the Koch curve were precisely what was needed to model coastlines. He wrote a very famous article in Science magazine called How Long is the Coastline of Britain? A coastline, in geometric terms, said Mandelbrot, is a fractal. And though he knew he couldn't measure its length, he suspected he could measure something else, its roughness. To do that required rethinking one of the basic concepts in math, dimension. What we would think of as normal geometry, one dimension is the straight line, two dimensions is, say, the box that has surface area. And three dimensions is a cube. But could something have a dimension somewhere in between, say, two and three? Mandelbrot said yes, fractals do. And the rougher they are, the higher their fractal dimension. There are all of these technical terms like fractal dimension and self-similarity, but those are the nuts and bolts of the mathematics itself. What that fractal geometry does is give us a way of looking at in a way that's extremely precise. 
the world in which we live, in particular the living world. Mandelbrot's fresh ways of thinking were made possible by his enthusiastic embrace of new technology. Computers made it easy for Mandelbrot to do iteration, the endlessly repeating cycles of calculation that were demanded by the mathematical monsters. The computer is totally essential, otherwise have taken a very big, long effort. Mandelbrot decided to zero in on yet another of the monsters, a problem introduced during World War I by a young French mathematician named Gaston Julia. Gaston Julia, he was actually looking at what happens when you take a simple equation and you iterate it through a feedback loop. That means you take a number, you plug it into the formula, you get a number out. You take that number back to the beginning and you feed it into the same formula. Get another number out. And you keep iterating that over and over again. And the question is, what happens when you iterate it lots of times? The series of numbers you get is called a set, the Julia set. But working by hand, you could never really know what the complete set looked like. There were attempts to draw it, doing a bunch of arithmetic by hand and putting a point on graph paper. You would have to feed it back hundreds, thousands, millions of times. The development of that new kind of mathematics had to wait until fast computers were invented. At IBM, Mandelbrot did something Julia could never do use a computer to run the equations millions of times. He then turned the numbers from his Julia sets into points on a graph. My first step was to just uh, uh, draw mindlessly a large number of Julia sets. Not one picture, hundreds of pictures. Those images led Mandelbrot to a breakthrough. In 1980, he created an equation of his own one that combined all of the Julia sets into a single image. When Mandelbrot iterated his equation, he got his own set of numbers. Graphed on a computer, it was a kind of road map of all the Julia sets and quickly became famous as the emblem of fractal geometry. The Mandelbrot set. They intersect at certain areas and it's got like a, you know. And they have little curlicues built into them. Black, beetle-like thing crawling across the floor. Seahorses, dragons. Something similar to my hair, actually. <laughs> With this mysterious image, Mandelbrot was issuing a bold challenge to long-standing ideas about the limits of mathematics. The blinders came off, and people could see forms that were always there, but formerly were invisible. The Mandelbrot set was a great example of what you could do in fractal geometry, just as the archetypical example of classical geometry is the circle. When you zoom in, you see them coming up again, so you see self-similarity. You see, by zooming in, you zoom, 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 you're zooming in, you're zooming in, and pop. Suddenly, it seems like you're exactly where you were before, but you're not. It's just that way down there, it has the same kind of structure as way up here, and the sameness can be grokked. Mandelbrot's mesmerizing images launched a fad in the world of popular culture. Suddenly, this thing caught uh, like, like a bushfire. Everybody wanted to have it. I thought, this is something big going on. This was a cultural event of great proportions. In the late 1970s, Jane Barnes had just launched a business designing men's clothing. When I started my business in 76, I was doing fabrics the old-fashioned way, just on graph paper, weaving them on a little hand loom. But then she discovered fractals and realized that the simple rules that made them could be used to create intricate clothing designs. I thought, this is amazing. So that very simple concept, I said, oh, I can make designs with that. 
But in the 80s, I really didn't know how to design a fractal because there wasn't software. So Barnes got help from two people who knew a lot about math and computers, Bill Jones and Dana Cartwright. I had Dana and Bill writing my software for me. They said, oh, your work is very mathematical. And I was like, it is? That's my weakest subject in school. We had a physicist and a mathematician and a textile designer. We had so much to learn from each other. I did not know what a warp and a weft is. You know, Jane, her ability with numbers is fairly restricted, if I can put that politely. All of, um, the parameters here, we're guess, there was a way we were going to communicate. We were going to get together somehow. And it really did happen pretty quickly. The general fashion press thought, Jane's a little nuts. They started calling me the fashion nerd, you know, but that was okay. That was okay with me because I was learning a lot. This was fun and very, very inspirational. I'm getting things that wouldn't be possible by hand. You know, sometimes when I think about things in my head and I say, you know what, I just saw light coming through that screen door. And look at the moraine effects that are happening on the ground. Can I go draw that? No way. But I can describe that to my mathematician. This kind of reminds me of. He sends me back the generator, all ready for me to try. And I, I sit down at the computer and say, well, let's see what it's doing. And I have parameters that, that I can control. And I keep pushing, and I go, wow, this is not what I expected at all. Um, at all, but it's cool. Use the false loop. The same kinds of fractal design principles have completely transformed the magic of special effects. This is a, a key moment from Star Wars Episode Three, where our two heroes have, have run out onto the, the end of this um, giant mechanical arm. Um, and the lava splashes down onto the arm. My starting point here is to actually take the three-dimensional model and take essentially a, a jet and, and just shoot lava up into the air. This looks kind of boring. It's doing roughly the right thing, but the motion has no kind of visual interest to it. Let's look 